والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, الحمد لله رب العالمين uh, time is moving and this is going to be our last Thursday session for the year we will resume inshallah bismillah on the 11th of January so that's two weeks away may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to meet us safely and return safely and be in a good state of Iman, in a good state of health when that time comes. Today we're going to take a break from learning about Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And we are going to think about how do we as believers plan for the year that is ahead of us? How do we plan for the year that is coming? And what are some goals that we should be having in terms of this is a new year that is coming to us? And what should we actually do? When we come back, inshallah, we'll continue the life of Umar ibn Khattab from the opening of the uh, different cities and towns and the conquests that are going to occur in this time. And bismillah, in January, we should finish up the life of Umar ibn Khattab. Uh, but for today, we'll take a break. And we'll see where, you know, what we should be doing these next two weeks. I know that some of you, or a lot of you, will have a lot of free time on your hands. So there should be a time where you are planning of when do you want to accomplish the coming year. Before we even talk about it, we have to make it clear that for us, dates do not matter. For us, dates and the changing of one month to the other really do not matter to us. What matters to us is two dates. The day that you were born and the day that you are going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So we don't look at it as this is a year, a time for us to celebrate the fact that we finished a year and we're beginning a new one. Even when we enter the new Islamic year. And you know, this is the one that we should actually be using in terms of um, our ibadat and also in terms of the, like how long we have lived and so on. But because we live in this society and we understand the concept of this is a year that is ending and a new year is beginning, there is no difference between January 1st, December 31st, and January 2nd to us. It is a day like no other. No, it's not a day of celebration. It is not a day of sadness. It is just a day. But it has become a day where, because of the society, they mark it as, this is when we begin our counting. And it's always good for the believer, no matter the day, no matter the month, and no matter the year, to always be in a constant state of reflection. That he's always thinking about how were the days before and how are the days after going to be? What is ahead of me and what is after me? The Prophet ﷺ, he describes a person that has intellect and he says about that person, it is a person that he holds himself accountable. He looks at you know, what is in front of him. And we have the famous statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab where he says that this life it is Daru Amad, that this is the land of working, this is the place to work. And tomorrow, it is Daru Hisab, it is the day that you're, you're going to be held accountable. Things are going to be given to you, and things are going to be taken away from you. So before that comes, prepare yourself. See where you are going to be on that day. How are you going to be when you look back, when you are given the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described as, that it does not need the little things nor the big things, except that it is going to be there and it is going to be, you're going to be accountable for them. Before you are given to them, a believer is always looking at where am I actually? What were the things that I did? How do I improve? And if you look at the life of the Prophet, this is what you find that in every state, in every state that the Prophet ﷺ is in, there's always the thinking of what is going to come tomorrow and what is what has happened before. Right? When we, for example, look at the hadith of the Prophet, ﷺ, Aisha radiallahu anha, she asks him about him praying long nights, about him praying long nights, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven him for what comes and what like what's in the future sins and the sins that have passed. And he responded and he says, Should I not be a thankful servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Meaning that the person that his future sins have been forgiven and his past sins have forgiven, doesn't he have a right to actually be thankful for these things? Because what has happened before has been forgiven. 
right? And when you look at countless ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, even in the adhkar that we do, that we learn from the Prophet وسلم, there's always this reminder of we're, there is something ahead of us. There is something that is in front of us and there is something that is behind us. And there needs to be a time where we pause and we look at it. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, He says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullaha wa al-tanzur nafsun ma qaddamat lighat that let every single nafs look at what it has prepared for tomorrow. This day that is tomorrow is not really a day that is tomorrow tomorrow, but it is a day that is ahead of you, that you will have no choice but to face. Right? And the believer, the strong believer, is always in a constant state of worry of where am I going in the future and what have I done in the past? What were the sins that I did? What were the sins that I did? And what were the good deeds that I did? How do I make them better? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he says that every single day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me, every single day, that I do not increase in goodness, it is me getting closer to the fire or me decreasing in my decreasing in the goodness that I have. So every day that comes to you, you have to look at was this a day that I spent? Was this a day that I spent in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or was this a day in which I wasted the time that I was given? And then tomorrow comes, same thing. So when we come to these moments that we realize this is a date that I can mark, that I can look back and actually say, from January 1st to the coming January, where am I? What have I done? And for the coming one, what am I actually going to do? What is in front of me? Right? Especially as believers, this year has been a very, a time of calamity. For the believers, a time of calamity. In the beginning, we heard about the earthquakes in Turkey and in Syria. Then we go from there. You hear about different calamities, whether it was in Sudan, whether it was in Morocco, whether it was in Libya, whether this was happening today in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease the affairs. Wherever you look, you just see calamities after one another. So it is very important for you and I to look at this and say, this entire year, Allah has given me help. Allah has given me security. The blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have been raining down upon me that I am just swimming in those blessings. While other people, other people, they're not receiving those blessings. Their blessings are of another kind. But when that is happening to them, what has this actually done for me? Has this been a year where I can look back and actually say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected me from those calamities? Therefore, I was thankful for what Allah has done for me. Or was it a year like no other? Was it, or was it a year like those that came before that I cannot believe 2023 is over? I was still thinking it's 2022. Now 2023 has come and it has gone. I don't know the good deeds that I have done. I don't know if in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I have increased my rates. I know none of those things. But I do know one thing for sure. That this was a year for us living here. It has been a year of barakah. It has been a year of Blessings just continuously coming. Us being protected from calamities after one another. And it is not like you and I worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point, or we had a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point, where we were saved from the calamities that had befallen our brothers and sisters. This is not how it is. We haven't done anything to prevent it from us. But it has been from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these calamities have been turned away from us. For that, how did we spend the year? And if the year coming is going to be similar, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease the affairs of the believers. If it is going to be similar, what am I actually going to do? Right? And whenever we come to these moments, there are a few things that the believer has to prepare in front of him. There are a few things that he has to prepare in front of him. The first one, whenever a person looks back, whenever a person looks back, the first thing that he has to do is seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There has to be an increase in the toba that we do and in the istighfar that we do. Because if you look at really any, any type of ibadah that we do, as soon as we finish and we look back to it, what we are commanded to do is seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it is after salah with the adhkar, whether it is after Ramadan with the zakah, whether it is after my business, whatever it has earned, that at the end of the year passes, I have to look back and pay my zakah so that I can purify it, 
or whether I am a person that committed so many sins that when I go perform Umrah or Hajj, I am looking back at it as, you know what? This is a cleanse for what I have done this year. So the first thing that we have to understand, we have to be a people that are increasing and seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making tawbah. Istighfar and tawbah, just to make it easy for us to understand, the difference between them is one is easier than the other. Istighfar is much easier than tawbah. Istighfar, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in all of his gatherings, from one gathering to another, he would do it how many times? How many times? 70. 70 or 100. And this would be, like if we're sitting in this class for 30 minutes, for 40 minutes, we would be seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we go home and we begin talking with our families, we would be seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 70 times or 100 times. In every gathering that we go to, we are always seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for the sins that we commit, whenever we make istighfar, they will take away, they will take away all of the minor sins that we have done, that we do whether we know it or we don't know it. Whether I have you know, wronged or I've transgressed against the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, constantly seeking istighfar or making istighfar will make me from the people that these small sins are going to be wiped away. Then after that comes, there has to be tawbah that as a believer I make. In tawbah, we said the difference between tawbah and istighfar is that we, one is easier and to do istighfar, you have many ways. But the easiest one is you just continuously repeat what? Astaghfirullah. This is the, the, the most smallest one. Or if you're even unable to say that, you say, oh Allah forgive me. Right? Depending on what's easier for you. What will actually make you have more khushur? Is it going to be, oh Allah forgive me or astaghfirullah? And it's different for the people that are sitting here. There's some of you I can say astaghfirullah. After my salah, I say astaghfirullah 33 times, but I, the only way that I know I've actually said it 33 times is where are my fingers now? But if I were to say, oh Allah forgive me, it might actually cause me to pay more attention to it. And that's up to you to decide how you're going to seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or you could increase it from there and you could say what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, astaghfirullah, I tubu ilayh. I seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so this is part of istighfar. Or you say that what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said was Sayyidul istighfar. The master of seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is it? What is it? Huh? Wa ana abduk. Wa'adika ma istata'at. أعوذ بك أيه علي وأبوء بذنبي اغفر لي فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت طيب this is سيد الاستغفار as the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned to us if you have you know on your phones uh, what they have uh, these Akkar apps you go to it I don't know how to say it خلاص it will be there for you you will seek this forgiveness from Allah سبحانه وتعالى now we move to توبة توبة Tawbah. It is a three-step process. Three-step process that we have to go through for one, for major sins, and also for sins that are minor, but we have turned them into major sins. Right? And the sins that are turned, that are minor, that are turned into major sins, are sins that the Prophet ﷺ described and he says that every single servant has a sin that he's constantly doing. Like he, he just goes back to it over and over. For those type of sins, a person needs to make tawbah. And the way that a person makes tawbah is the first thing. It is to seek the forgiveness of Allah for what you have done. The next thing, it is to while you're seeking the forgiveness, you feel remorse for what you have done. You actually like feel like this was not something that I should do. And then the last thing, it is to make a promise to yourself that you are not going to be, you will not go back to this place. That you will not go back to this sin. Now we're saying you're making this promise that you will not go back to this sin. But we just said there's a sin that we constantly go to over and over and over. 
How does it make sense if I tell myself, Ya Allah, I am not going to return to this. I'm not going to go back to this sin. But maybe this is the sin that has been written upon me and it is going to come back again. Then I become like the man that the Prophet ﷺ said that there used to be a man before you who committed a sin. He came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when he came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Ya Allah, that I've committed a sin, forgive me. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the malaika that look at my servant that he, he knows that he has a Lord that can punish him for the sins and can forgive him. And he says, bear witness that I have forgiven him. The Prophet ﷺ says, some time passes and this servant comes back again and he says, Ya Rabbah, Oh Allah, I've committed a sin. And it is the same sin that he sought Tawbah from. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him the same thing. Look at my servant. He knows that he has a Lord that can forgive him and a Lord that can punish him. Bear witness that I have forgiven him. The man goes away. Comes back a little bit later. Same sin. And he comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, I've committed a sin. And then forgive me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the malaika, look at my servant. Look at my servant. He knows that he has a Lord that can forgive him and a Lord that can punish him. Bear witness that I have forgiven him for as long as he's like this. I let him go and live his life. But if this is the state that he finds himself in, that he commits the sin, same sin, comes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, makes tawbah, Allah will forgive him. Goes, some time passes, commits the same sin. Seeks tawbah, Allah will forgive him. For as long as he's in these two states of committing the sin and seeking tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. Right, so you and I, when we commit major sins, may Allah forgive us for our major sins. When we commit those sins, we have to make tawbah. We have to make tawbah. When we say major sins here, right, when we say major sins here, we don't mean it in the sense of what the sharia considers the kabair, the major, major sins. Major sins that we are looking at here are the sins that you do intentionally, that you know before you do it, that I'm going to fall into this, that I'm actually going to do this. And you continue to do it. This is a sin that requires tawbah. But for example, for example, we look at minor sins. And really the believer, right, this is how we're talking, but the believer should never look at his sins and think about them with me, oh, it's a minor sin, this is fine. Or if it, this is a major sin, Allah is going to forgive me. This is not the relationship that we should have with sins. The relationship that we have with sins, whether it's the big one or the small ones, we fear that this is what's going to destroy us. We fear that this is what's actually going to come and destroy us on the Day of Judgment. One of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, he says to the Tabi'een, he says that you treat the sins that you commit as flies that you could swipe away with your face like this, while we, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, looked at those same things as being from the mubiqat, as being from the things that are going to destroy you. And this is from Allah to the Tabi'een. The companion talking to the Tabi'een. That they would belittle the sins the companions would look at as, this is what has, like, a mountain is ahead on top of us, it is going to fall on us. Right? So a believer doesn't look at sins as, these are the small sins, these are the major sins, it's okay if I... I should not be disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves. Especially for people like you and I, who Allah like we see in real time the blessings that we have, the ni'mah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So are the things that we are giving back to Him just going to be the sins that we commit while knowing the blessings that we have, while we are gathered in safety in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, while we have been given the tawfiq to be able to be here, that our, our, what we give back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we are going to be sinners and say, you know what, these are minor sins. This is not how the believer looks at them. So now, when we do those sins, those that I know this is a sin and I go and I do it, I need to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On top of that, make the oath, right? Those three steps, make the oath of, Ya Allah, I am not going to go back to this. I am not going to commit this sin again. And then if it happens again, make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
all you want is when the angel of death comes to you, it is in the times that you have made tawbah, and it is not in the times that you have returned to the sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our tawbah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for shortcomings. So this is the first thing whenever we look back. The other thing that when we also look back, it is to actually look at what were the good deeds that I have done? What can I actually say? I did this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I have hope in Allah that this is going to be accepted from me. You know, one of the most dangerous things that we have in our times, it is the understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has to accept my deeds. That what I do, Allah has to accept it. Why? Because I live in America, I live in Santa Clara, majority of the Muslims are not here, I came to the masjid. I came and I prayed. I came and I listened to the dust. I came and I sat in the gap. Allah has to accept what I'm doing. This is not how a believer thinks, right? Because we know that the conditions of our deeds being accepted, and we've said this many times, we have two conditions. One that they are sincerely done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how many of us can look back at this year and say that everything that I have done in terms of ibadat, that they were done and the per like the niyyah behind them, the purpose why I was doing it was for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like today, if you look back, what brought you to Isha? Was there someone that you were going to meet in the masjid? So you decided to come? Or did you come during the time of Maghrib and you had free time and you some just managed to stay around the masjid and then Isha came upon you? And you're like, khalas, let me pray. Or was it that I am here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is what he has commanded me to do. And I am only doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What well, brought you to this dars today? Is this so that the people that you are sitting next to can say, this was someone that came to the dars with me. Right? So how many of us can look back, not just at today, but the entire year and really find a deed that I say, you know what? This, is the, this was done solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? You guys know the story of the three people that are trapped inside of the cave. Right? There's a big storm, they go into the cave. A uh, rock falls and covers the mouth of the cave. And in this, while they're there, they tell one another, the only thing that we can do now, it is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and think of the deeds that we did that we did only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make dua with them to see if Allah is going to lift it. And really, if we think about their situation, if you and I were in that situation, one, would we have a deed? And then also, why are they only mentioning one? Why are they only talking about one deed? Couldn't one of them say three deeds that he did solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that through that the stones will be lifted one, two, three? Why couldn't they do that? Because in reality, the, the entire lives that they live, all of them can only remember one deed that they think that out of all of the actions that I have done, this was the one that I, I myself believe had the most sincerity, had the most ikhlas. And I hope that this is the one that is accepted from me. And they didn't say things that we would normally say, right? So when they're like you and I, if we were told, look back today, and for you to make it to the days that are ahead of you, you have to pick a deed that you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted. Are we going to say the Isha of today? Are we going to say the Isha of yesterday? The Dars of last week? The Jum'ah that week? What, what, are, what is the deed that we can bring in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say that this is what was accepted from me? Right? You know, Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, he has his famous statement where he says, that if I know Allah accepted one deed of mine, one deed of mine, that would be enough for me. And that would be enough. And this is a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. When you look at the statements where Abu Bakr al-Siddiq says, I wish on the day of judgment that Allah turns me into dust. That he just turns me into dust. Because he doesn't want to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look at the deeds that he has done. When you have Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu saying that if there is going to be a call made out on the Day of Judgment that says every single one of you will go to Jannah except for one person, I fear that I am going to be that one person. 
Because of the way that they looked at their deeds, the way that they looked at their, their bad deeds, is the way that you and I look at our good deeds. They looked at their bad deeds as if this is what's going to destroy me. We look at our good deeds, all of them, and think, Allah has already accepted all of this for me. There's nothing in front of me except Jannah. That when I pass away, not only am I going to be from the people of Jannah, I will have the VIP ticket. Because look at how much I prayed. Look at how many times I was in the masjid. Look at the classes that I went to. Look at how I dealt. All of these different things. If they were not done with ikhlas, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the first condition of them being accepted. And one that is even harder than this, and one that is even harder than this, it is the second condition, that a person's deeds that he does, they have to be in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. How many of us can look back and say, the actions that I have taken were done every single one of them, or the one that I think will be pleasing to Allah in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. What do we know about the sunnah of the Messenger ﷺ to know that this is how he did his, what he would do. When the Prophet ﷺ tells us, and he tells the companions, Sallu kama usalli, Pray as if you have seen me pray. How many of us today would say if the Messenger ﷺ came, and he looked at our masajids, he would say, these are a people that are praying like us. Or these are a people that are play, praying like I pray. Right? From the way that we come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the ways that we pray the sunnah, from the ways that we deal with the people, from the ways that we interact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Right? Do I even know what that is to be able to say I did it in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa For a majority of us, no. I don't even know how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa prayed. I don't know how he did the things that he did. Right? So when we look back, again, if you've been told, Pick a deed that is going to save you and give you time until next year. What deed am I going to pick? The Isha that as soon as I said Allahu Akbar, every single thing of the dunya came to me that I don't remember the ayahs that were read in the salah that I prayed. I was here for Maghrib. If you ask me what I asked, I don't know what I asked for it. Why? Because as soon as I said Allahu Akbar, I was not here. That's the deed that I'm going to present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, this was the one that was done sincerely for you. Right? Was it the fasting that I did in the Ramadan that passed? While the whole day I am just planning for what am I going to have for iftar? What food am I going to have? What, what, what was my wife making for me? Right? The taraweeh that I went and said, Ya Allah, I did this for your sake. And I prayed for 30 days and Ramadan comes or Ramadan ends. And it was just, you know what? Taraweeh does not know me after that. What deed am I going to present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Was it the way that I dealt with the people? Was it the way that when I went to work, this is how I worked? Was it the way that when I saw people in the streets that needed help, did I actually go and help them? And when I helped them, did I do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or was it, I can feel good about it? I can say, you know what? Tap myself on my shoulder. You know, look at how amazing of a person I am. I went and I helped them. So what deed, when I look back, can I say, Ya Allah, if I was trapped in that cave, I will say to you, this is the deed, lift the rock, if this deed was accepted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us for sure. Now, these two things of ikhlas and following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they can only be achieved, they can only be achieved in following the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in knowing what these two things even mean. And the way that a person knows that. It is by learning. So when I look back, when I look back, one of the things that I have to ask myself, was this a year in which I continued to swim in the fields of ignorance? Or was this a year in which I, like my knowledge is different than it was last year? That you know what, this year, I actually learned how to pray Salah properly. It was this year that I actually learned how to fast properly, how to read the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly, how I should be in my business transactions with the people. How I should be. Was this a year in which this increased for me? Or was it a year that the things that I knew when I learned when I was younger, I'm actually getting further away from it. Now I can't remember it as I did in the beginning of the year. I don't remember what I learned when I went to Sunday school. Why? Because now it's another year away. So where am I? Where am I going? 
You know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in the Quran? Inama yakshallaha min ibadihi what? Al-ulama. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those that fear Allah, that truly have the khashya of Allah, are the ulama. Here in Nama, what it means like, these are the only people. These are the only people that fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That for you to actually have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to be from someone that knows or someone that is described as being from the ulama. Right? And this is like what this ayah is telling us. It is not when you and I look at people that are ulama, ulama, we're not looking at them to say, just because you've studied this many years, just because you've sacrificed this many years, now you deserve this title, you belong to this group. That's not what it means. The ulama, they are a people that fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are able to do the things that the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the dealings that they have with the people based on the knowledge that they have been given. Whether that knowledge is small or whether that knowledge is big, right? A lot of knowledge does not benefit a person that does not implement it. If a person learns and learns and learns, but at the same time, his deeds are just decreasing and decreasing, then he becomes from the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him, Do you command the people to do good? Because you know what to say. You know what to tell them. Then at the same time, you forget yourself. As the poet, he says, to the people that teach and so on, that you are a person that Allah has blessed with knowledge. And you have the medicine to the sicknesses of the people. And you freely give it to them. Why you yourself are sick. Why you yourself need it, but you're not giving it to yourself. So whether I've, learned, whether I've gotten to the point of being a scholar to it, the, the, the way that the people describe it, or that I know enough to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the more that I learn in this knowledge, this is how I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, أَمَا إِنِّي أَعْلَمُكُمْ بِاللَّهِ وَأَخْشَاكُمْ لِلَّهِ I know the most about Allah. From all of you, I know the most. Therefore, I fear Him the most. Showing you that you can never fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while being a jahil, while being an ignorant person. How can a person that doesn't know Allah, that doesn't know what Allah requires of him, can then come and say, I fear Allah. What do you know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fear him? What is there for you to fear? Who is Allah to you? Right? So we as believers, as believers, we are a people that are constantly learning. So I look back this year and I say, did I increase in knowledge this year? Or did I increase in my ignorance? That I continue to just be how I was? Now every few days I have to go to somebody and ask them where my hands should be when I do takbir. That do I say ameen out loud or do I say it quiet? Or do I, is it more virtuous for me to be in the first row or in the second row? Or is it what breaks my salah? We cannot be a people like this. Especially a people that have been blessed with what they've been blessed with. For us, whenever we look back, number one thing that should come to us is Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved us from calamities. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us that whenever we see a people that are, tri that are tried with calamities, that there is a dua that we should be making. Because they will know what we should be saying. Alhamdulillah, alladhi aafani. Al-Mabtala. Like Kathir, like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a dua that you should memorize. That whenever you see a people that are being tried, anywhere, whether it is you're driving and you see someone get in an accident, whether it is someone that you walk into the masjid with them and they fall down, that what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us to say, it is alhamdulillah, all praise is due to the one that has saved me from what this person is being tested with. And he has given me virtue over many of his creation. And for us, we can see. You and I today will go home, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless us. We'll get into our warm cars from here and go into our warm homes and we'll go to sleep. And bi'idhillah, we'll wake up in the morning in raha. Our concern tomorrow morning when we wake up and we have to eat breakfast, it is not going to be, is there food at home? But it is going to be, out of all the options of breakfast, which one do I not want today? What am I going to take? 
I don't feel like this is the morning for me to eat pancakes. I don't feel like this is the morning for me to eat cereal. I want eggs. Actually, you know what? I don't feel like I should eat breakfast today because I know during lunchtime I'm going to this place. It's going to be Jum'ah. I'm going to go with a friend. I want to save my appetite for when I go there. While we know people, we know people, and for all of us that are sitting here, these people don't even have to be people that are suffering. Our own family members that we left back home. Our family members that are back home are going to wake up in the morning and their concern is going to be, what, do I, what am I going to feed my children? What are they going to have? Not that there's so many options that I have to argue with my children. No, I want this. No, I want that. All of this can be made for you. While you'll have your cousins, your aunts, your extended your family that will wake up in the morning no idea where food is going to come from, or even if food is going to come. So you are a person that is living in this, in this blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now how are you going to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it? Right, so a person that wants to fear Allah, that wants to be thankful for the blessings that he has been given, he has to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So there has to be, and this is a plan for the year that is ahead of us. If this was not a year in which I am satisfied with what I have learned, not, I'm not satisfied with the knowledge that I have earned. This ha I have to have a plan of how am I actually going to learn? What am I going to do next year that's going to be different? Is this finally going to be the year where I, at this age of mine, will know how to perform Hajj by myself? Is it going to be the year where Zakat comes, I don't have to ask anybody else? That I can look at my wealth and say, you know what, this is how much I have to pay? Is this going to be the year that in Salah, I'm not going to go up to somebody and worry about is Surah Al-Fatiha a pillar of Salah or not? And this is questions that people ask. Not little kids, not teenagers, not young professionals. People with gray beards come to me and ask about Surah Al-Fatiha. Is it a pillar of Salah or not? And if I don't read Fatiha, is my Salah something? This should not be a place that we find ourselves in. And if we don't have a plan to learn these things, 2024 will come and go faster than 2023. 2025 will come faster than 2024, 2023, 2022. I cannot believe this is the year that we are actually in. It feels like we just started. We took a few blinks, now we're into the next year. Before we know it, we'll take a blink and we're going to be in our graves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala widen our graves. So we have to understand that 2024 is going to be the year that I will not be responsible for the things that I have to do in terms of knowing. I will know how to properly pray salah. I will know how to properly fast Ramadan. I will know that if I break my Ramadan in this way, this is what I have to do. These are the bare minimums that a believer needs to know. That what are the things that destroy your ibadat? And how do you avoid those? What are the things that you do in order for you to perfect the ibadat that you do, the worship that you have? On top of this, how, why is it that one of the biggest, most asked questions that we have are things that deal with riba. And it is not like deep riba that everyone, like only a few people know. Even the, if we were to ask you today, what, what is riba? How many of you would be able to say Islam, this is what, like, this is what Islam considers riba. What does Islam view as a contract? These are things that today, a plan has to be there, that next year if I am asked this, I am going to know it. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq and to increase us in knowledge. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is told in the Quran, to say to Allah, increase me in knowledge. And this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everything that he needs in terms of knowledge, who is it coming from? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is sending wahi to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He doesn't have a teacher that he's going to go to and sit under and say, teach me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, even with this, ask Allah to increase your knowledge. And when you look at the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single one of them, they were blessed with knowledge. And not only this, you know when we think of the prophets that were blessed with Allah, one of those that come to our mind, are the father and son, Dawood and Sulaiman. 
And when we think of Dawood and Sulaiman, the blessings that Allah has given them without really the calamities that other prophets go through. They did not struggle as other prophets, but they were given many of it, many blessings that Allah gave them. On top of these blessings, if you look in the Quran and you were to say, what is the first thing that they say about, like what, what, what are they most thankful for? Right, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَقَدْ فَضَّلْنَا وَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانَ وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُدَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمًا وَقَالَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي فَضَّلَنَا عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we've given to Dawood and Sulaiman knowledge, we've blessed them with knowledge. And they said to that, that Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has elevated us far greater, far higher, than many of his righteous servants, believing servants. Why? Because this knowledge that they were given. And the thing that they say after, وَعُلِّمْنَا What? وَأُوتِينَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ that not, we were taught how to speak to animals, to understand the speech of the birds, to understand the speech of... Why are they mentioning this when they were given the power of the wind? To be able to tell the wind, go from here to here. When the jinn were put under, were subjugated to them, and they can tell them to do whatever... The first thing that they mentioned, we were taught how to speak to the birds. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Musa, when he talks about Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَاسْتَوَى for Musa, or وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ أَتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا to Yusuf, that we gave you knowledge and we gave you wisdom. To Musa, when he reached that age of maturity and he reached the, the time of strength, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we gave to him wisdom and we gave to him knowledge. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing his messengers. This is how he's describing them. So you and I, we need to be from a people that are from amongst these. That we are a people that are learning. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he says, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ What? فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى هُو عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ That seeking knowledge, it is an obligation on every single Muslim. You know when you look at this hadith, the correct understanding that you should have is that if I consider myself a Muslim, Seeking knowledge has become an obligation. This obligation, it is not a fard kifaya, meaning that if some of us do it here, the rest of us are saved. Every single one of you, you have obligations that you have to learn from them. How do I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If I don't learn this, I cannot come in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Allah oh forgive me. That I paid 20 years of salah and I didn't know what broke it. And I was engaging in things that would break it. And now I come to Allah, oh Allah, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years of my salah, 30 years of my fasting, 30 years of this and this and this. None of us accept it. Because you didn't know how to properly do it. You didn't do it once, sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On top of it, you did not do it. You did not do it with the understanding of this is how the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did it. And this is where we understand that this has to be a year of gaining knowledge. It cannot be a year of continuously being ignorant of the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thinking that we are going to come to Allah and say, you know, I went through Ramadan, therefore I have taqwa. I went through Ramadan, therefore all my sins have been forgiven. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told me that from salah to salah, Everything is forgiven as long as I stay away from the kabair. And think, you know what? For the past 40 years, I have not missed a single salah. Therefore, there is no sin that I have committed. I am going... Who told you these salahs were accepted? Did you know even how, how to pray them? Did you know it? Did you do it in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala increase his knowledge, make us from the people of knowledge. The other thing that we have to do, looking forward, Besides telling ourselves we have to increase in knowledge, at the same time we have to tell ourselves this has to be a year where my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes. Knowledge is not beneficial if it does not lead to action. If it does not make you a better person, it is better for you to be ignorant. 
knowledge, the more that it comes, the more that it comes to you. At the same time, your level of like how you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to change. That you have to, the science of this knowledge needs to be seen on you. You can't come to a hadith class and listen to the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُدْ That whoever believes in Allah in the last day, let him say a good word or keep quiet. And the moment that you leave the class, all of your engagements are just your speeches, the words that you are using, words that are earning the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, you came to the class. Yes, you sat there. Yes, you heard it being explained. Yes, you understood it. But if this did not translate to you worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better, then it would have been better for you to not be there. Because now you're going to come in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you, you're going to be asked, you knew this and you did not do it. You knew what you were supposed to be doing. But you did not follow through. So yes, we want it to be a year where we increase in knowledge. But we have to make sure that we are people that are also increasing in actions and in taqwa. The more your knowledge goes up, the more your ibadah becomes better. Right? Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he says that the people should not learn what is fard and sunnah inside of salah so that they can say this act is sunnah, I can leave it on. That is not the purpose of learning. That is not the purpose for you to learn. That I don't have to do these actions because they're sunnah. But it is that I, I know these things. How do I actually get the best out of what I am presenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So there has to be a, a, a plan that is made. My relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets better. It increases. The more that I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith Qudsi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that my servant does not get near to me except with what I have made fard upon him. The ibadat. The more that a person does this, this is how a person gets closer to Allah. So worship has to be there, ibadah has to be there. Then after that, our, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to change in the sense that we are going to become people that follow the next part of the hadith. That yes, I am doing all of the fara'i. So I have completed the first step in getting close to Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this hadith Qudsi, He says that the more nawafil that my servant does, it is going to continuously get him closer to me. So it has to be a year where we, we're not just focusing on the farad, but we're also focusing on the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fast every Monday and every Thursday. Prophet ﷺ told his nation, his ummah, that they should fast at least three days out of the year, out of the month. The Prophet ﷺ said that the best fasting a person could engage in is that he fasts one day and he breaks his fast the other. From these nawafin, which one am I going to be part of? Or am I going to say, you know what, these are sunnah? Two months, three months into the year, Ramadan is going to be here, I'm going to save my energy for those 30 days. We do not be people like that. So there has to be from the nawafil things that I look at and say I have to increase in them. And the best of nawafil that a person could do are three things. Seeking knowledge, fasting, and praying qiyamul layl. These are the best nawafil that a person could engage in. Without a doubt, we know the virtues of seeking knowledge. We have the statements of not only the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, but also the imams of them saying that Seeking knowledge, it is more beloved to us. It is more beloved to us than standing a thousand nights of rak'ah or a thousand rak'ahs and different variations of this. Right? We, have, we understand this. And then at the same time, we understand that the Prophet ﷺ described the night prayer. And he said, that upon you it is to pray Qiyamul Layl because this was the righteous practice of the righteous people before you. And then he says, ila rabbikum, And this is going to draw you near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that the Prophet told us that the best salah that a person could do after, after the written prayers, after the, oblig, uh, the obligations that we have of five, the best of them is that a person does Qiyamul Layl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet Ya al Muzammil, kum il layla illa qalila. And you should stand the entire night, except a little bit of 
Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell the Prophet this? In the beginning, he says, Inna sanulqi, what? Alayka qawlan thaqila. You need to prepare yourself for what is ahead of you. And standing during the night, doing some type of ibadah during the night, because heavy words are going to come to you. Heavy, hard difficulties are ahead of you. This was a year of difficulty for the believers. And it might have been a year of difficulty for you and I. The way that we are going to be able to handle that, it is to follow this verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pray during the night time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he describes the believers as what? تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمُضَاجِمْ That they, they're forsaking their, their sides from their beds. They get up while the people are sleeping and they're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ What? الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا And then, وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا What's the next verse? وَالَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ وَتُهُوا لِرَبِّي That they spend their nights Who? The عباد الرحمن The service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala They spend their nights Not sleeping They're spending it and standing and making ruku' and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ayats and ayats, we could talk about them. Talk about them. But we should know the virtues of prayer qiyam al On top of that, that, we know that our day times, there has to be times where we are dedicating to the fasting. The fasting. This year that is coming up, we cannot be a people that fast 30 days of Ramadan plus 6 days of Shawwal and tell ourselves, Jannah is waiting for me on the other side. Not only is Jannah waiting for me, First ticket, I'm going to be that first person. We cannot tell ourselves this. We have to be a people that are constantly fasting. Then we, don't we see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You know, for you to understand how much he would fast, you look at the hadith where he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes to the house of his wives. And he says, do we have food? They say, no. He goes to the next house. Do we have food? No. Next house, no, 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 no. And finally, he says, okay, today I'm going to fast. Do you think the Prophet Sallallahu would do this once or twice? Or this would be a regular occurrence? The companion said about the Prophet Sallallahu that he would fast so much and we think that he would never break his fast. From the amount of how much he's fasting. And then there would be times where he's not fasting and we're asking, when is he going to fast? So there's this balance. But we have to be a people at the minimum every month we fast how many days? Three days at the minimum. At the minimum, I have to fast three days a month. So when January comes, if I haven't done it in December, you're going to do it. Better for you to say, you know what, I'm not going to count January. I'm going to say January comes and it's going to be what month? It's going to be Rajab. Well, it's actually going to be Rajab. Half of January? Okay, half of January. So you're telling me half of January is Rajab. Sha'ban, Ramadan. Half of January, half of February. Allah allow us to be for Ramadan. It is right here. We will blink and it will come. And then we will blink and it will go away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that benefit from their times. So there has to be some fasting that I do in the year, at least three out of the month. If I am able to do eight, which is two days a week of Monday and Thursday, blessing for you. If I'm able to do more than that, that I'm a person that does the eight and also does the three, whether it is the three white days or three other days, now blessing for you. That means that the entire month, you have 30 days or 29 days, you fasted how many? 11 days. You sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for the ni'mah of Ramadan, or the ni'mah, the blessings of fasting, all you have to look at is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he says, that for the fasting person, he has two moments of happiness. That he has two moments that he's going to be pleased. Happiness is going to overcome him. The moment that he breaks his fast, because he understands that this was a day dedicated to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala where I sacrifice my needs to worship Allah. And then on top of that, the biggest moment where he's actually going to be happy, when he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he looks back 
And he says, these were the days that I fasted in the seat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how many of those days do I want to have in the year 2024 with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it going to be my 30 days, hopefully my six, my Arafah, my Ashura? Khalas, that's enough for me. That's all I need. Those are the days that I want to be happy. Out of 365 days, I want to look back at the year and maybe look at 40 days and say, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we gave Musa 40 days. Therefore, I did my 40 days. I'm going to. No. No, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the minimum half of the year he's fasting. Half of the year he's fasting. Okay, I'm not like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can I do more than 40 days? 40 days, if I even do that, it has become the minimum. Can I increase it to out of 300 days, 365 days, 355, whatever? I'm going to fast 100 days. 100 days sounds like a lot. But if I have 12 months, and one month of it, I'm already fasting. So I have 10 months to do 90 days, to do 70 days. Think about it. 11 months for you to fast 70 days. Very easy for us to do. I can sacrifice that much, and I can look back on the Day of Judgment and say, Ya Allah, out of 350 odd days that you gave me, I sacrifice these for your sake. I want to be able to do that. So we make sure that there's a plan for me to increase in fasting. There's a plan for me to increase in qiyam. There's a, there's, there's a plan for me to increase in how I'm going to seek knowledge. And if I do these three things, I can look back at the year and say, Ya Allah, this is a year that I hope through it I'm getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the year that is ahead of us better than the year that we have left behind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for all of our shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on those that we love and those who love us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the year that is ahead of us a year of happiness, not just for us, but of every single believer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return the honor of the Ummah to it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a year where we no longer have to worry about our brothers and sisters in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them victory. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant them victory. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them patience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for their patience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept those that have passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them victory sooner rather than later. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those that have passed away elevate them in our eyes and in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them with the shwada. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring happiness to us in this year and in next year with the liberation of our brothers and sisters all over the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate them. I'll see you guys on Thursday, the 11th of next year. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.